It was a journalist who said, don't be a Christian, be a Christ. And the stories are at the bottom of the world. Where did Christ go? He went to the bottom of the world. And that's where we are in mission as missionaries. Welcome to the Lausanne Movement Podcast, where we have a passion to accelerate global mission together. If you like today's episode, won't you take a moment to rate and review our podcast and subscribe? That way you won't miss a thing. And now for today's interview. Well, Jenny Taylor, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you, Jason. That's just amazing to be here. Well, Jenny, you know, one of the Lausanne Movement's fourfold vision statements is kingdom impact in every sphere of society. And we've had business leaders on the podcast speak about how business is a sphere of society and the impact that can be made for God's kingdom through their influence. But one of the major spheres of society is media and journalism. And it's, I think, one of those, those spheres that whether we know it or not, or whether we like it or not, we are being influenced by media. Media has, plays a massive impact and on the way that we think about ourselves, how we interact with society. And that's why I'm very excited to have you on the podcast today, because you have dedicated your life to journalism and you view your role in journalism as something deeply connected to the mission of God. And so to kick us off, just as we begin this podcast, could you share with us and with our listeners how you see the role of journalism fitting into the mission of God? Yes, that is a great question. And thank you for the introduction there. The gospel is public truth. And I don't see journalism as a discrete sphere. I see it as uh, impacting all the other spheres. So in fact, it is the fourth estate it's outside all the other states in order to impact them all. The gospel is public truth. And what other way is there really uh, to impact the world with that truth and through the media? Yeah, so I, I'd be curious to hear from you. Uh, off air, you mentioned to me how you came to have a vision for journalism as a mission field. So would you mind taking us back to that moment where you came to a revelation of Jesus and what that meant for your career? It's been an extraordinary journey. I was a journalist from the age of about seven. I, I edited the fashion page of the primary school magazine. You know, I mean, it's in your DNA. And I used to cut out little pictures of winkle pickers, remember them, and then describe them. But when I, when I became a Christian, something so profound happened. I was, I was about 30 when it happened. And God gave me this amazing verse from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. In the old version, the old King James Version, then it says there, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that they may run that read it. And I had trained as a tabloid journalist in order to galvanize people with ideas that had been boiled down in a form that they could use. So I see news as something, as information that moves you to, to act. It just, the, the becoming a Christian deepened and broadened the thing that God had already given me to do. And so it's gone on. But as I have gone on, I've started to realize that actually journalism is not just something Christians can use, Christians created journalism. Well, why don't we talk about that? I mean, I'd be very interested. One of the first times, actually the very first time that I heard that journalism had Christian roots was through you. And so I would love to hear, could you share some of those insights into the historical roots of journalism with our audience? Indeed. And I think really the context is if we keep in our minds the fact that journalism happened first on the continent of Europe, China had had printing since, I think, the 8th century and was printing Buddhist texts. But they didn't have journalism until the missionaries got there with their printing presses. Journalism is prophecy. And, and I've been thinking, well, Muslims, you know, Islam worships um, God through the downloading of the Quran of a prophet. You know, they don't worship Muhammad, but 
Muhammad is a prophet. So why did Islam not begin, not start journalism? It started on the continent of Europe. Um, it has very, very deep roots, Hebrew roots, and the origins of a writing of discourse itself are Hebrew. This was the first time that spoken language was written down. And it turned everything on its head. So instead of writing being the edicts of the king to the people, writing became the prophet delivering the word of God to the king on behalf of the people. And so the whole tradition has gone on. So journalism is actually really communication to the people about justice and, and truth. There is a lot about this in, in my book. But it was the Reformation, really, where writing took off because of the printing press, Gutenberg's printing press in the 15th century. But the Reformation was, again, about the translation of God's words, as it had been for the Hebrews, for the people, for liberty, for justice, for truth. And you find that wherever the translators have gone, Wycliffe, for example, to translate vernacular spoken languages into writing, you get journalism. So the first newspaper in an Indian language, for example, was written by English missionaries in Bengali. Samachar Pradhan, I think it's called, which means news mirror. I mean, it just is extraordinary. These things go together. So the Reformation, you had Luther, writing so passionately and copiously that print all the, the were, printers couldn't keep up with him. And this generated, what he was writing was so fantastically exciting. People wanted to learn to read. His pamphlets were proliferated to an extraordinary degree. And in fact, the translations of the Bible were the foundation stone of capitalism. So writing the words of God generates passion. And, and brings life and liberty. And this is what uh, journalism is supposed to do. And not just, not just that, but the Calvinists realized that actually God in his creation could be trusted so that whatever happened told you about God. And when printing presses went over to America, do you know the first journalist in America was a preacher? Oh, I did not know. That's amazing, yeah. And so people were being trained to read reality as the actions of God. And so they wanted to know what was happening. They wanted to know what was happening in the world because it told them about God. And, um, you know, there are, there are many attributes to this, but actually the first newspapers in America were news sermons the first news actually in Italy was Savonarola's sermons. He was Catholic, but he printed his sermons because not enough people could get into the cathedral. Only 14,000 people could get into the cathedral to hear him. So they wanted to buy his sermons, which were short printed works. So the connect here between the gospel, the translation of the scripture, the communicating of God's words, on a daily basis, you know, this nexus is visible everywhere where the missionaries went. The first newspaper in China was produced by American missionaries. For me, it's just amazing to hear the history. The question that really comes to the forefront of my mind is, is what happened? If this is the origins of our faith, like if journalism has its origins in our faith, and it makes so much sense, you know, that we speak about God being a God of truth and the gospel being, being light in the darkness. And so the connection to journalism just makes so much sense. But what happened? Because as, I mean, the State of the Great Commission reports references under one of the topics on trust, the question of what can we trust in today? And one of the, the stats that were shown was the lack of trust with journalism and how, you know, we, we just know like South Africa is one of the least trusting countries in the world. And we just don't trust journalists. It's, it's, they're up there with lawyers as well. So it'd be interesting to hear from you what happened. 
it is uh, a truism that the corruption of the best is always the worst. And not only will the devil get in and muck everything up, particularly because of money, but Christians themselves don't know the story and have removed themselves from the spheres and particularly from journalism, but oddly because they regard journalism as somehow tainted, as you know, not a fit subject for a, a decent law-abiding Christian, you know, to have anything to do with, because you do have to skate a bit close to the sail a bit close to the wind to get stories. But the amazing thing is still in the West, and of course it's going every single day, there are conventions of privilege for journalists. You can report Parliament, you've got no more and no less rights than men and women on the Clapham omnibus, um, but there's freedom of information. I mean, the First Amendment in America is about freedom of speech, and that derives from John Melson, the great Puritan, who is regarded as one of the foundation stones of journalism, let truth you know, play in the field, and it will not be wronged by untruth. It's actually truth is very powerful. So what happened? Well, money happened, and power, and corruption, and so on. But there is such a thing as public interest journalism, and I find that the people involved in the recovery of public interest journalism, or um, it's not dead yet, so I should really say the preservation of it, when you talk to them, they tend to the light comes on, happened to me earlier this week, just talking to a chap who'd founded a magazine in Namibia, a political magazine. And he said, it's just extraordinary. He said, I'm not a Christian, but my parents, my whole background was, and South Africa is full of Christians. This makes so much sense. He wanted to create a magazine that would fight injustice, you see, fight apartheid. And they did, and they set it up, and it was award-winning and was profitable. Journalism is the fruit of Christendom. I mean, yes, there was always news. There's always been news. The Caesars used to post news up on the walls of the city. But journalism, you know, there's still a convention that news should be free. So, so I'd be interested. You mentioned earlier the need for the church to reclaim the legacy that we've left on journalism. How do you see the church doing that? I mean, that is such a big question. And all I can say is get involved. Pray, pray, and get involved. I mean, what I really hope is that people will read my book and the lights will come on. We've got nothing to offer the world and certainly nothing to offer journalists unless we're excited, unless we're passionate. And the thing you can tell about Christians in the media happened to me the other day at the News UK conference. There was only about one person in the whole, you know, of all the panels who, and he was a South African, and he's actually running the News Futures project, News Futures 35 it's called. It's a 10-year project to recover the viability of public interest news. And he was passionate, and I knew that the light was on in that guy. So I've got all sorts of ideas as to things I'd love to see. I would love to see a younger generation of sacrificial Christians fanning out into the hard places around the world and reporting from there. It is a mission, and we don't do missionary work for money. We don't do our Christian work in order to pay our mortgage, because God has said he will provide us with whatever we need. Seek first the kingdom, you know, and, and that is what I did, because I just I was so excited about what he was giving me to do. I just was amazed at the stories I was discovering when I joined a missionary society. I was a hack, and they didn't trust me. I was sent off to mission college, and to my chagrin, I discovered it wasn't to train me. It was to check me out, because <laughs> journalists are such you know, terrors. So for three months, I was being checked out, and then they decided to send me to China, which was as far away out of trouble as possible. And in fact, God called me right back to Interserve uh, to edit the House magazine, and I had the best time of my life, traveling and getting stories, you know, amazing. You know, you mentioned that, that scripture, seek first the kingdom. 
I would be really interested to hear some of your stories. If you have any to share of what you describe as missional journalism. So from your own experience, what are some stories that you can share with us of how you use journalism for the kingdom? The thing about Christians not being involved in journalism is that not only is the truth not getting told, but journalists are missing stories mm. to the detriment of whole populations. And I discovered that the war in northern Uganda had not been being reported at all. I mean, there were a few pieces in the tabloids kind of, you know, making fun of this kind of wizard, Joseph Coney, who was, you know, a repulsive character who was had over, I think, 16, 17 years had been abducting children and putting them through the most atrocious torture. Only half of them had ever been found, been seen again. And those that returned, you know, were mutilated. They didn't have their noses. They didn't have lips, didn't have hands. And I went up to that part of northern Uganda on a with the Church Mission Society, which didn't have anybody in northern Uganda anymore. Although we'd taken the gospel a hundred years before, we had somebody, an amazing little lady in Kampala, and a builder from Cumbria who was helping in southern Sudan. Um, and so Pauline invited me, come, you must come and you know see what's going on. And I was only up there for three days. And it was absolutely harrowing. Mm. And I met these returned child soldiers. I listened to their stories. I I was so traumatized. I went up to the front line of the war in Sudan as well, because the two areas connect. And then I went, and I just promised the bishop, I said, you know, my goodness, you know, he just said, do something, do anything, help us. And so I said, I'll do what I can as a journalist. And I went home and we started the Break the Silence campaign. And for two years, we were wading in blood. We were generating prayer. I was working with Lindsay Hilson. She's a famous TV journalist. I was working with whoever I could, working with the government, the UN, and telling, telling the story. I mean, it had been forgotten. It had gone on for 17 years. And the, the world agencies weren't there. And we were convening meetings with Human Rights Watch, Oxfam, Christian Aid, International uh, Crisis Group, and prayer. I mean, we were harnessing prayer. I've never prayed so hard and so much. It was a suffering. There were speeches in Parliament and the Foreign Office, which when I started didn't even know where this area was, the bloke I talked to in our Foreign Office had to look at a map. I mean, it was shameful. But by the end of our campaign, we got David Oyelowo involved, who was a friend of mine. He used played Martin Luther King, you know, big Hollywood guy, worked for nothing, all sorts of stuff. By the end of this, I mean, and just to add that Jan Eglund, who is a name that we hear all the time, he was the humanitarian rapporteur for the UN. And he just said what was going on in northern Uganda was worse than Iraq. That was shock and awe, Iraq. He said how he couldn't understand how it had been allowed to go on. Well, it had been allowed to go on because journalists did not get religion. And this was spiritual. Joseph Coney saw himself as an agent of God, reinstating the Ten Commandments. And I mean, you know, it was he was mad, he was bad, he was in cahoots with the devil. And you needed a spiritual sensibility. You needed to understand the categories, to speak to the people, to understand spiritual fear, to to, to put it all together. You know, this was this is about humanity. And in the West, we've split our souls from our bodies, from our minds, and we operate in one, one silo or another. By the end of that two years, Joseph Coney had gone, and he never came back. He never came back to Uganda. There is a, This story is written in full for the Commonwealth Journal of International Affairs. He is still alive, sadly because the Western agencies thought they could negotiate with him, and he's still rampaging around in Central African Republic, but vastly depleted. He himself said, my power is gone. I could talk all day about what I learned, but everything that I learned from this campaign, I then poured into the charity I set up called Lapido Media. 
and Lapido means to speak up, to advocate in Acholi, in the Acholi language. That's what we have to do as Christians. That's what the prophetic mission is. And that's what journalists do or should do. So that's my big story. But there are other stories about stopping the building of the Tablihi Jamat Mega Mosque in Newham in East London, uh, which is going to be the biggest mosque in Europe for Islamist training. And I was the expert witness at the final planning appeal on that as a journalist who had visited their headquarters mosque in Delhi. So I could speak, you know, I made it my business to find out about them and ask, why do you want to build this huge mosque in England? We've got a perfectly good religion of our own, you know, etc. I did, I spoke to the emir. I had to sit on the gra- on the floor because I was a woman with my back to him. So he didn't pollute himself with, you know, looking at a woman, etc. I got Melanie Phillips on the hook writing her book, Londonistan, because she didn't know anything about Islam. And that went into five editions in the first year because I knew about Muslims, about Islam. I'd done my PhD on it. So that's just a few stories, uh, but there's plenty more. Yeah, I feel like there's there's a lot more that we could dive into. And, you know, just I just want to take a moment just to stop and to thank you. You know, as a, a younger Christian leader, I, I look and I hear your stories and and I'm just in awe. I'm, I'm inspired by your diligence. I'm inspired by your willingness to go where other people weren't willing to do that. And so I just want to take a moment just to honor you and thank you for what you did. Thank you, Jason. And, you know, I think it, it goes back to that original thing we spoke about at the beginning, which is this is a great example of kingdom impact, the, the kind of impact that believers could make and should be making just by beginning to view their life as a conduit for the kingdom of God in their sphere of influence. Absolutely. We all have a purpose, but that's I'm very touched. It has been an enormous privilege, you know, to have this role despite everything, God is there, or whatever else happens, God is there. And he wants us to go exactly, as you said, where others won't go, and to say the things that others won't say. And he does give us the power. And I was able to name Jesus Christ from the platform of a foreign correspondence club in London, which is where I launched. And I got away with it. <laughs> Well, if anyone is listening to this and they doubted the way that God could use journalism for his kingdom, I think they, <laughs> I think we could all be at peace knowing that God does indeed use journalism for his kingdom purposes. Could you just share a few more ways in which you see journalism as missional? So often journalism can be dividing. My experience of the COVID era was that depending on which news outlet you were listening to determined what camp you were in. And it just became, media became almost like a source of a great division. And so I'd be interested to hear from you. I mean, part of our call as believers is to be reconcilers, to be bridge builders. So how do you see your role as, as not only a truth teller, but as a bridge builder? Yes, it is uh, such an important question. And perspective, you know, is a big issue. And we will all have different perspectives. And that's why it's so important. I mean, there are four Gospels. So there are always going to be different versions of a story. That doesn't mean that one is truer than the other. It just means that we all are standing in slightly different places. And so a free press is about many flowers blooming, and we should not um, regret that. What is worrying is when you get monopolies like Google. But I'm thrilled that Google has lost its antitrust case and that hopefully this empire will be broken up so that the money can be given back to newspapers from whom they effectively corruptly took it. But um, I think that as journalists, part of our role is, this is public interest journalism, and we've got to be trying to interpret a different thought worlds to others. So we are ourselves interpreters. And one of the tragic things is, and probably during COVID, journalists were locked up. And, you know, when they report from foreign wars now, they're usually doing it from the rooftop of the hotel. And they're not allowed to get out and they're dependent on stringers and so on. But actually, 
mission is an amazing arena for journalists. You see, I was a secular hack, really, let loose on, on the mission field. And, you know, I could get to the source. I could, so it's, I could get to places where journalists weren't going, either because they didn't know, they didn't think, they weren't, didn't have budget. But also, Christians don't let them anywhere near. You know, so I was, you know, people had to be terribly trusting, and you've got to earn that trust. And, you know, I do have a very good example of that, if I may. I don't know whether you're too young to remember about the air crash on a mountain outside Kathmandu. It was a British plane full of aid workers and missionaries. And one of our families was involved in that. I better not say the name of the mission. <laughs> but the phone lines were jammed. I looked out of my glass window uh, office on the mezzanine floor, and there were three tabloid cameramen with the most enormous lenses. They were in the building. I didn't know what had happened. And they thought journalists were ringing they thought we were some wacky travel agent sending do-gooders, you know, or um, evangelists, you know, kind of terrible people. And I just knew that I was sitting on a, a huge story here. So I had to stop everything, issue a press release to the press association just saying we'll have a press conference at three while I find out what's going on. And... For different reasons, my dear colleagues, directors, I, I was a mere, you know, um, press officer. One of them wasn't there anyway. One came to my office and said, don't say anything. And I thought, oh, my God, they're in the building. I can't not say anything. Anyway, this is a glorious opportunity. And then the third locked up any information about this family and left the building. So there was just one director left who managed to find a prayer card of this family. And so we had the, the, the pre all the press came. I mean, it was huge. And we were able to tell the story, my friend Simon and I, from our own angle. We control the message. And the next day, every newspaper in the country and actually in the world, because this was such a huge, you know, air crash is a huge, this was about the sacrifice of Christians for the poorest nation in the world, Nepal. And uh, the prayer card was printed in the Daily Mirror on page two. I mean, you know, so it's, it's journalists actually love altruism, but the church wants to control. And there is a lot of fear. And of course, there was genuine reason for fear because you know, maybe all our good work in the pool, we were running fantastic water projects and so on, could be in jeopardy if the story went wrong. But actually, we've got to have faith in journalism as much as in anything else. So it takes two to tango, you know. It's got to be journalists being allowed and finding people who have the passion because journalists love altruism, as I say, when they, they just don't see very much of it. So Jenny, you mentioned the need for like almost like an ecosystem of every kind of journalism in order for journalism to be free. But how do we, and maybe this is a question for you to answer personally for yourself, how do you discern what kind of media and journalism and, you know, like news outlets that you engage with, how do you discern what you would listen to and not listen to? Do you have any do you have any way to to help us as Christians to say, okay, I need to be discerning because this is shaping me? What principles would you give us? Such a good question. And actually the choice is not as great as we think. So much of the media now is simply being used as a mouthpiece for the dominant group. You know, the dominant discourse comes out of the government. And in this country, do you know, I use Twitter. I use Twitter because actually you've got many, many, many flowers blooming and I get to learn whose tweets I 
trust, but I also keep an eye on those I don't trust and because you can get into an echo chamber. But with the demise of independent journalism, I mean, with the Southport riots, for example, there was no independent journalist on the ground. So it was several days before the truth got out, in actual fact. You know, there was a lot of rubbish actually on social media. So nonetheless, what's going on in these parts of the country, it's only Twitter that is carrying some of the angles to do with, you know, migration and other religions and so on. It's only Twitter that's carrying those stories. And I think that religious literacy is absolutely paramount in the way that we decide what we're going to listen to. And we've got to improve our religious literacy. And I mean, you know, we've got to learn about the dark side of globalization, because that's what I did my PhD on, Islam in Britain and secularization. I wanted to know what was going on in the inner cities. So that was, <laughs> I got that in 2001. So I think God gives us the gift of discernment. And, you know, we can get it wrong because we're fallen. But I don't hear that word being used. You've used it in your question. And it's something that journalists have to develop. And I think that Christians tend to not trust their own discernment. We're very taken for a ride. We are trusting people. But the answer is not to switch off. It's actually to switch on. It's to insist, it's to reclaim, to reclaim our story, to reclaim the gospel as public truth and to participate, to, to be involved and to pray. And of course, you start with prayer, don't you? Because then God can direct your steps. That's probably, I don't know if that gets anywhere near an answer. Well, I mean, I, I do think that it's helpful to even begin to process the question and even to hear that you are, are using Twitter as a way to do that. You know, I know that many people have just written Twitter off as just, they've just written it off as a place where people are just trolling everyone. And so it's very interesting to hear that that, that is the place that you go to, to actually find truth. Well, you just follow, you know, there are good people on Twitter and there are real redemptive Twitter accounts. And there are marvels on Twitter that I would never have seen. And I don't get all the ghastly trolling. Well, that's that's good news. So, Jenny, I, I think at this point, this is the best time for us to transition and to talk about a new book that you are launching. It's entitled Saving Journalism, The Rise, Demise and Survival of the News. So could you take some time just to share why this is something ministry leaders should be concerned about and should be aware of? Thank you so much for this opportunity. This has been really a life's work. Because it's an odd book, it falls between the stools. It attempts to reunite secular and the sacred, and really journalism is, is in a sense, the bridge. So I've had to write as a secular person and as a Christian in a way that both can understand, and it tells stories from my past but it recovers the history of journalism. It recovers not just the history of journalism, it attempts to recover the pathway of discourse through Bible translation. And the Bible has had the most incredible role for 3,000 years. Don't ever, ever underestimate it start to learn what it's actually done. I mean, if it weren't for the Bible, we wouldn't have democracy. We wouldn't have the public square. We wouldn't have public opinion. We wouldn't have reading and writing. I mean, it was the Bible translators in Africa who gave the colonized peoples the tools with which to get rid of us because their spoken language was written down and the colonizers had writing and so on and so on. And I learned that from a former Muslim who became professor of history and world mission at Yale. So in the West, we're being terribly, terribly browbeaten about all the terrible things we did. Actually, there wouldn't be a West. There wouldn't be hospitals in India. You know, I mean, this is very controversial stuff, but we've got to, God is good 
and he's used us. He's been good to us. Let's recover our confidence. Again, my great guru and patron, Leslie Newbegin, wrote a book called Proper Confidence. And I hope that this book is a prism, you know, through which to see our story and to recover our confidence and our strength and our passion in the West. Because we may have sinned grievously, but, you know, we all need each other. We all need each other, wherever we come from. So I'd be curious to hear from you what your thoughts are about the future of journalism. I mean, this book titled Saving Journalism, it, it kind of, you know, you know, we're in an age that AI is on the rise, social media is everywhere. Social media influencers are in some regards, you know, telling stories and giving their perspective on things. How can journalism maintain its vital role within society amidst all of these shifts that are happening? I answered your previous question by going back. We do have to go back in order to go forward. And again, there's no shame in that. But the future of journalism, I believe, is healthy. I think it's been through a terrible, terrible stripping and sifting over the last few decades. And of course, there are only half the number of newspapers that there ever were, half the number of journalists. Um, the great newspaper in London, the great Evening Standard is now just a weekly. This is one of the greatest newspapers in the country. And it looks like social media is winning and the AI is winning. However, AI can only be trained using real stories. And those stories, where do they come from? They come from flesh and blood journalists out there on, you know, pounding the streets. And they've been exploited, rotten. You know, newspapers have been used without compensation to train the robots. That is a market and publishers are getting wise. And you will hear every day there are stories about forcing big tech to pay for what it's using. And when the chief executive officer of the Financial Times, John Ridding, actually says that, you know, this is a market and they've got to pay and they will have to pay. And when you hear that Google has been humbled completely and that its billions might well be funneled back into newspapers, you know, I'm cheering to the rafters. There is a wonderful project called News Futures 35, which I think I mentioned earlier which I'm involved in, where I'm actually helping uh, academic journalists with their methodologies using discourse analysis, which I used on government documents for my PhD. And there is an open door. Again, I had no idea. You know, I mean, it's like I've been swimming in this vast ocean, not knowing quite how this book was ever going to come together. I've had so little collegiality around me. I did have funding, thank God, from a wonderful Christian foundation, J.W. Lang Trust, through the Kirby Lang Center. But very few people actually working, or Christians working on this. And as I swim towards the shore, I'm, there are people waving. It's like something is really happening. Something is really stirring. And your interest at Lausanne, I've been involved with Lausanne for many years on the global analysis and, you know, wonderful missionary stories and the joy of this global family. We're all going to be coming together. I just, I really, really do think that we've got an opportunity as evangelicals, as passionate Christians and as communicators with a story to tell, you know, let's go for it. So for those who are interested, where can they find your book? When are you releasing it? Give us the details. Uh, it should be coming out at the very end of October uh, with a very fair wind uh, with Pippa Ran Books based in Cambridge. And I am indebted to Prabhu Guptara who got the vision. I've known him for many years, a passionate believer and communicator and entrepreneur. His website is www.pipparanbooks.com. I also have a page devoted to it on my own website, jennytaylor.media. It will, of course, be in all good bookshops, um, particularly over uh, India. Prabhu has works with Penguin India for distribution purposes. It will be available in America, so that should give you a few 
I didn't. Yeah, great. I'm going to be sure to put that in the show notes for those who are interested in finding that. I also want to say for those who are going to be participants of the Soul Congress, either virtually or in person, we will have a version of this book accessible to you on our online hub for you guys. So just under digital giveaways, it's there for you guys as well. So it's a gift from Jenny. So thank you, Jenny, for that. Jenny, as we begin to wrap up this podcast, I'd be curious to hear from you, you know, like just to take it one step deeper into practicality for those who are listening. Not everyone listening to this are journalists or aspiring journalists, although I'm trusting and I'm hoping that maybe someone who is is saying, wow, okay, I never thought of journalism as an opportunity for God's mission and maybe it's inspiring them. But for the rest of us, we are involved. And, and you mentioned earlier that mission is a major arena for journalism. We're in mission. We're on the ground. How can we become better storytellers? What advice would you give us to, to almost leverage our voice to bring about the kind of change that, that you've been able to do through journalism? Do you have any advice for us? I think it's motivation. It was a journalist who said, be a Christ. He said to journalists, don't be a Christian, be a Christ. And the stories are at the bottom of the world. Where did Christ go? He went to the bottom of the world, and that's where we are as in mission, as missionaries. And everything you do, actually, everything you do is a story. I just think we've got to do a bit of translating for ourselves, you know, and we've got to see ourselves in that light and stand back slightly from ourselves to see how can this help the wider world, instead of holding on to our stories and our communication in a sort of very protective way, how can we let them go? You know, how can they fly for God's kingdom? Mm -hmm. We've got to change our mindset. As we wrap up, is there any a key takeaway or thought that you would like to leave with our listeners? Hudson Taylor said, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. He was no relation. But I have taken that for myself. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I mean, you can't end a podcast better than with a Hudson Taylor quote, in my opinion. So <laughs> thank you for, <laughs> for sharing that. And, and Jenny, just once again, I want to thank you for your time and for the legacy that, that you have left for us. The rest of us, we, we're standing on your shoulders and we appreciate the work that you have done. And I don't expect that your work is done yet. I expect that there's far more that God's got in store for you. And so I look forward to seeing how God's going to use you in the future. I'm fit as a flea and I'm looking forward to the next chapter. Wonderful. And to seeing you in Seoul. It's going to be great. Jenny, thank you so much for your time. Well, my pleasure. Thank you, Jason.